you ever heard of the Fru Fra Mata Saran? Me either. <laughs> Awkward beginning. Until a business trip last January brought me face to face with it. it. It turns out that in the 13th century, a group of monks formed out of gold a 10 foot tall, 11,000 pound statue of Buddha. It's priceless. And we almost lost it forever in the 17th century because a, a group of invaders swang down through this land and these monks had to decide, how do we protect this priceless piece behind me? How do we protect this thing? So they decided to cover it up. They masked it with mud and plaster and grime and cements and shards of colored glass. They made it disappear. So when the invaders came through, they did not see the true value below the stone. And they kept it covered up. Not just for a generation or two generations, but for 234 years, they kept this thing covered up. Until 1954, when a group of movers are taking a large, ordinary cement structure of Buddha, and one of the guys trips, the rope breaks, and a little crack forms. And they see within the little crack a glimmer of gold. So they peel it back a little bit farther, and a little bit farther, and a little bit farther. And they rediscover this jewel, this gold, this light that had been there the entire time, this Buddha. What was once left in the north of Thailand to rot under a tin roof is now one of the most celebrated landmarks in all of Thailand. So what does the golden Buddha have to do with you or Ted? Good question. My friends, I, I, I think we all use makeup. I think we all cover up. We all put on masks each day of our lives. We apply makeup, though, less as a way to magnify our beauty and much more of a way, I think, to cover up who we really are, to hide our imperfections. Because we've all been broken, we've all made mistakes, we've all lost things near and dear to us. We've lost friends, family, parents, children, marriages. We failed in relationships, we failed in business, we failed in school, some of you are nodding your heads right now, that's right. We have failed in life. We have been burned. We have scars. We have a story. It's just usually not the story we're telling the world. And today, my friends, I'd like to share with you my story. The story that took me a long, long, long time to pull back the plaster, to embrace, and to celebrate. I want to take you back to 1987. I'm nine years old. I'm doing great. I'm one of six. My mom and dad are married. I'm going to brag for a moment, but you already see it in the picture. I'm extremely good looking, okay? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to nod your head. Bangs like that, okay? That is either a laser level or, or what else might it be? It's a freaking bowl cut. That's right. <laughs> Third row nailed it. And that little white thing below my chin, what's that called? Dicky, first row. A dicky. Life is good. Mom and dad are together. Dogs are in the backyard. Church on Sundays. Blueberry pancakes afterwards. Fried chicken Sunday nights with my grandma and grandpa. It was good. And good always changes. Not necessarily for better or worse, but good life always changes. Count on it. Bet on it. As a nine year old, I decided to see what might happen if I mixed fire and gasoline. The result was this massive, mighty explosion. Split a five-gallon container of gasoline in two. It picked up the little boy and launched him 20 feet against the far side of the garage. Changed my life forever. One moment, I'm that perfectly happy and healthy. Everything is perfect, little boy. And in the next, and this next picture will be hard to look at. You may want to shut your eyes just for a moment. I found myself as a child on my back. I'm nine. I have burns on 100% of my body now. 87% are third degree. It is a death sentence. I'm dying. And I remember laying there scared in the hospital, looking up at the bright lights with one thought. 
for me, all I could think was, oh my gosh, my dad is going to kill me <laughs> when he finds out. And then I hear his voice down the hall, the old man getting closer. Oh no, I hope he doesn't find me. He finds me, he walks in, he points down, and the first thing he says is, I love you. Ooh, I wasn't ready for that. Then my mom came in, I was scared of her too. She walks in, the first thing she said to me, I love you. And that morning, January the 17th, 1987, a nine-year-old boy, flanked by his parents, made a covenant to fight on. Not toward success, not toward the dreams of tomorrow. We had a very simple goal in mind. We were in the fight of our lives, and we were going to win this thing. We were going to go all in trying. We were going to go home someday from this hospital. We were going to fight for it, and it was a fight. It was a struggle. It was hard. When mom and dad left, the doctors had to come into the room, and they actually had to tie me down to the bed, and it would be this position that I would spend the next five months. My lungs were burned, so they had to put a trach in my throat. So now I can't breathe on my own, I can't eat or drink, I can't talk. It's like being at a TED event. <laughs> and because of swelling, I can't see. And eventually the swelling would die down enough that I could open my eyes and see, and eventually they could unhook me from the bed and slowly get me to begin slowly recovering. But burn recovery is about the most painful experience you can endure this side of hell. Uh, there's bandage changes, there's physical therapy, there's occupational therapy, there's torture that takes place all day long, every day, and for us it's five months long, and yet the fight continued, and eventually we won that fight. And I never looked back. I never wanted again to think back to those bandage changes, those scars, that experience, that pain. We moved forward. We came home. We came home. And then eventually we had to go on with life. I remember going back to grade school. It took about a year to get back. I was in a wheelchair, uh, wrapped still, lost my fingers, bandages all over my body and splints on the other half. I looked a little bit in fifth grade like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Okay, that, that's not cool. And... Because my hair was finally coming back in after months and months and months of them shaving my head to take skin from my scalp as a donor site. When my hair finally does come back in, it comes in like a black, thick mop. So I look like Liza Minnelli, okay? <laughs> this is not working for other fifth graders, so I'm different than everybody, and I can't hide that. But my dream as a fifth grader is to be normal. How can I fit in? How can I be like every other little boy and every other little girl in the room? That's what I want more than anything else. Just be normal. And that remains my goal through middle school into high school. In high school, I was not very athletic. I, I know that surprises you with how athletic I look today. <laughs> but I'm not athletic. I'm not that artsy. I don't have a great voice. I'm not that popular. I can't do a whole lot of things that my other friends are doing. So I turn to the one device that I can finally own myself and be successful in. And, and by the way, mom and dad, if you are listening right now on YouTube, just fast forward about 25 seconds. Okay, you won't miss anything. <laughs> it's drinking. That's something that I can excel in. I can party hard on the weekends and be accepted for who I am on the weekends. So I turn to it. And by college, partying on the weekends means Wednesday through Sunday. Okay? And I'm able to drink more, consume faster, stay out later than anybody else. It's the claim to fame. It's what normalizes a little boy. For me, this buzz wasn't about the alcohol. It was just about fitting in, just about being normal, finally being accepted, not having to see my scars anymore. And that longing to be normal continued on even after graduation. I started my own business. If you can think of anything that a guy who's been burned that doesn't have fingers would struggle mightily doing, think carpentry. And that's what I do. I become a carpenter. Then I learn how to hang drywall, sheet roofs, become a general contractor, become a real estate developer in St. Louis, have a blast, and the entire time I'm hammering on the roof saying to the world, I am normal. See? Now do you see? I'm normal. 
I'm like everybody else. I'm just a normal guy. Now do you finally believe me? And the only one I think eventually that I was lying to the entire time was me. That's who I was lying to. But eventually erosion takes hold in your life. And what erosion reveals is what was there the entire time. What was there the entire time. My mom and dad were able to expedite erosion a little bit for me. Because what they did 10 years ago is they wrote a book about our experience. Imagine this. The story, the scars, the thing we have been covering up our entire lives. That someone who knows you better than anybody else. That they write a whole book about it. (laughs) An unauthorized biography of your life. And then they plaster your freaking picture on the front of it. Just imagine how this thing goes down. I got to read my book. The ones who knew me best wrote it. And I looked at the picture and immediately I saw the scars on the neck brace. So I turned into it because I didn't want to see that much longer. And I started at page one. And a few hours later, I finished. And I looked back at the cover. And I saw the scars. You can't miss them. And I saw the neck brace. It's unavoidable. I saw the handle of a wheelchair. I saw the pain of yesterday. But for the first time in my life, I saw the other side of the coin. I saw what was really going on in that picture, if you have eyes to see it. I saw a smile. I saw a lot of courage. I saw a lot of faith. I saw a light in his eye. I saw gold in his story. It was the first time in my life I had started to realize, gosh, maybe it wasn't all bad. Maybe it wasn't all bad. The following day, literally, I took a shower. Uh, And don't worry, there are no pictures. (laughs) This is Ted X, not rated X, okay? You've been bored all day long. That's why you're in the wrong theater. It's two down. (laughs) And as I pulled back the curtain looking for my towel, I grabbed toward it, and then I saw myself in the mirror. You know when, when you see the mirror for a nice, hot, long shower and everything's foggy? And everything looks good. It's all, it's all good. It's perfect. All my scars were gone. All my imperfections. My fingers had regrown magically. And I remember just staring there, looking at myself in the mirror, being stunned at the beauty. And then the fog started to dissipate. And I started to see myself for who I actually was again. And I saw the scars. I saw the wounds. I saw the brokenness. I saw it all. It's unavoidable. And yet again, for the first time, rather than seeing it all as brokenness, I saw it for what it was. It was a story. It was a memory. It was a badge of faith and character and courage. It had led perfectly to where I was in my business, in my spiritual journey, in my finances. It led to where I went to high school, which led to where I went to college, which led to where I met a gal, which led to four children, which has led to everything beautiful and perfect in my life today. It's the direct result of being burned, not in spite of the fire, but directly because of it. And I never knew it. I never knew it. Four weeks after that experience in the restroom, in the bathroom, looking in the mirror, I got a phone call that also would change my life. It was a woman who had a daughter in the Girl Scouts. She asked me, Mr. O'Leary, if I would come and share my story with her group. Uh, I'm an introvert. I'm not a public speaker. In college, I took a class called public speaking, and I got a D in that class. (laughs) I've never told anybody, including dear friends, about my story. I'm just starting to figure it out myself. But in life, I've, I've figured out the way to answer almost any question asked of us. And the answer is yes. Yeah, yes. And so though it was the last thing in the world that I actually wanted to do, my answer was yes. I went. I got so nervous that I threw up in the parking lot on the walk in. I looked down at my notes, 20-minute talk, never once looked up at those little three monsters. (laughs) But it was my first talk, and it was the first time publicly that I'd embraced the story, publicly that I'd embraced the scars, and it began to change again my life. That first year, one talk, the second year, three. In the last eight years since, we have spoken more than 1,300 times in 50 states and in 12 countries sharing a tragic story of a little boy and loss and the triumph of what happens when we have the audacity 
to look in the mirror and embrace the honest reflection that we see. Our scars, and we all have them, are dark and useless when covered up. But when we uncover them, when we reveal them, when we brag on them, when we shield them off, when we share them, they are illuminative and they are inspiring. So what do we in this room do with a story like this? What do we do with the golden Buddha? What do we do with the shards of glass? What do we do with the mistakes in our past? Here's the simple challenge to you tonight. To go home, to reflect on your life story. Because everyone has a story worthy of being shared. It's just usually not the one we're sharing. Reflect on your story. Reflect on your scars. Reflect on your lessons. And then reflect on what has grown out of those experiences that have shaped you and formed you and molded you into who you are today. Those lessons from the past end up in time to become the foundation of the truth that our best days are yet to come, but they start now and they start in the mirror because the gold we seek, my friends, it's not more friends on Facebook, more followers on Twitter. It's the ability to look in the mirror and to realize the gold we've been seeking the entire time has always been within us. Thank you.